Hey everyone, Mark Montgomery here with Great College Advice, and this video is our first dig into financial aid. Now, the financial aid system is so complicated and so crazy that it really would take hours and hours and hours to explain every last detail. But I'm not going to do that in this video. I'm going to really give you the 30,000 foot overview of the landscape. Partly because yeah, it's super complex, but also because every family comes to this with their own questions and, they, and their own circumstances. And so it's really hard in a relatively short amount of time to answer all those complex personalized questions. So we're not going to try here. We're going to have some other videos that will dig into certain aspects of that. But for now, we're just going to dive into the, the basic overview and how to think about this and how to get prepared. So let's get going. The first thing I really don't need to tell you too much about because college is really expensive. And I don't care whether you're thinking about the private for your college that costs over $70,000 a year, or whether you're looking at your state university that may be several orders of magnitude less than that, it's expensive. Higher education in the United States is super expensive. And there are lots of reasons for that. And it's kind of crazy that we have allowed ourselves as a society to get in this pickle. but Right now, we can't get out of it. This is the way it is. Certainly, we can vote in certain ways to try to push our, our legislatures at the state and the federal level to reduce the costs. But right now, we, we are, as parents, we're kind of stuck. So the, the thing I want to talk about, though, is the cost of attendance. You need to make sure that as you're researching colleges and you're understanding what are the expenses that you are going to have as a parent paying for your student's education, you need to think of the entire total cost of attendance, the COA. That includes tuition, room and board, books, travel, and it also includes fees. And I want to highlight that because that is one of the ways that legislatures in this country for public universities have gotten around tuition increases because they have just decided to raise the fees. They don't raise tuition because that's politically unpopular, but they just raise fees. And these are hidden costs that you need to make sure that you are including when you are budgeting. The other thing to think about is these the, the, the student expenses, the personal expenses of a, of a student. Some students are very, very prudent. Some are profligate. And you need to know what... <laughs> what is happening in your family and you need to understand and specify what it is that is going to be included in this budget. Cell phone, Netflix password, you know, the pizza, beer, other consumables. <laughs> you, you have to make sure that you understand and you're clear about this. You understand for you and that your student understands and we'll talk more, more about that. So where do you start? Many families will begin by looking at colleges and trying to get a handle on what it's going to cost. Yeah, you got to start there. You got to know your cost of attendance, but you also really need to start with a very realistic assessment of your own resources. What are your savings? What are your assets that are available to pay for college today? Don't be wishful thinking about it. What have you actually got in the bank? And then also assess your current income stream. How much money can you put aside from each paycheck that will help you to pay for college? And don't count on having a raise in two years. Yes, that would be awesome. If, it's a ra if you get a raise, put that in your retirement account. Budget on what you have today and what's coming in today. I, as I will say throughout this video, don't be overly optimistic. You also have to think about what is realistic for your student to contribute to the cost of college. And a lot of families say, well, my kid is going to pay for college. All right, that makes sense, and that, that can be a good way to manage it, but you also need to be realistic about what a student actually can contribute at this tender age in their lives. So what is a realistic amount of money that a student can make during a summer holiday, and what is a realistic amount that a student can make during the school year without having a negative impact on their academic success? I highlight that, without having a negative impact. They can make the money, but often students who are busy making money will fail out of college 
and not have a degree because the burdens, the financial burdens are so great that they actually can't shoulder them during their college years. So I want you to be realistic as you're thinking about what it is that your student can contribute. So one of the things we have to also think about is who actually decides how much college costs and how much you are going to pay. So we know that we will be filling out these forms and whatnot and somebody will tell us, right, what we're going to pay. So is it the colleges that decide? Is it our students, our kids who decide, well, this is what I want to go to college and, I, and I, we need to pay this much money? Or is it you that decides? The issue is that the colleges determine what price they are going to offer you. The colleges decide, not the government, not you, not your student. The college decides the price that they're going to offer you. But you have the power to decide how much you will actually pay because they will give you a price tag and you are free to walk away. You are not obligated because that college tells you that's what the price it is you're going to pay. You don't have to do it. You have choices in the system. So remind yourself that number one, you don't control the price, but you do control your own wallet. So keep that in mind. So how are you going to pay for it? What are the basic buckets of money that you can draw on to pay for college? Well, first of all, there's, as I was just saying, the money you now have, your savings and your income. And again, just to beat a dead horse, really go in and look at how much money you actually have and make sure you're budgeting out for all the kids in your family, etc. Really be realistic about how much money you have available to pay for college. So it's your money and your income today. You also have money that you may have later. And these are called loans, right? This is money you borrow, but you will have to pay it off later. So this is financial aid, yes, but it's actually still your money because you will have to repay this money to the bank or to the federal government in some cases. So you, you, this is financial aid, but it is still your money that you are responsible for paying. So financial aid, yes, but no, because it's your money. And then there is OPM, other people's money. This is the money that you really want to focus on because everybody wants someone else to pay for our kids' college education, right? So we want to maximize the amount of OPM that our students are eligible for. What kinds of OPM am I talking about? Well, I'm talking scholarships and grants that come from the colleges themselves. And I want to emphasize that this is the largest bucket of money out there for OPM. The biggest OPM bucket. Schools, colleges, they have money that they give. So you want to really think about this one most of all. The second one is other kinds of scholarships that come from third parties, from your bank or your credit union or from a, you know, the German American Society or some other club that you belong to that, that will provide a, a scholarship to, in a certain amount. There are also competitive scholarships out there for, for students. Now there are lots and lots and you hear lots and lots about how there are millions of dollars that go unclaimed. We'll talk more about these third-party scholarships in a different video, but for now, just remember that these do exist, but they, they pay it all in number and amount compared to the dollars that come from the colleges themselves. Then we also have government aid. And this government aid is important, but it tends to go to the people who have the fewest resources, the Pell Grant being the most important federal grant program we have available to us. But again, this is, this is a, a hefty amount of money, but it pales in the comparison to the price of higher education. So if you are eligible for these, that's awesome, it's fantastic. I'm happy to pay my taxes so that you can have access to this, but know that it really does not cover the entire cost of higher education, not even close. But other people's money. 
is essential for most families in America as they think about college education. You have money now, you can pay money later in the forms of loan, in the form of loans, or you can maximize other people's money. And that's what we really want to do. So there are two basic types of financial aid, and we're going to talk about both and sometimes they get confused, but need-based aid is based on whether or not you actually have the money to pay for college. So families with fewer resources, with lower incomes, with fewer assets may qualify for need-based aid because they just don't have the wherewithal to pay these high prices. So this is a, a lot of this need-based aid comes from colleges themselves and a lot of it comes from the federal government as well as state government. State governments varying very much in how much aid they provide to their own students. Merit-based aid is based on, as you would expect, the merits of the student, the talents, the abilities, the grades, the test scores of the student. So that may be in addition to need-based aid or it may be completely separate. So families who are rich could get merit-based aid based on the talents of their student. And families who are poor could get both kinds. So there are two different conceptual buckets of money out there for families to be considering. How do you know if you qualify for need-based aid? Well, there is a series of forms that help us to measure our need. The first one comes from the federal government. This is the FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. And this is a form that seems very much like an IRS uh, 1040 that you fill out prior to going to college, opens up generally in October of the senior year, and families fill this out. And you use data from your tax return and data from your bank account, and you plug it all in, and the government comes back with a number. This is, this is a, we'll talk more about that number. But for all need-based aid of any kind, it is absolutely essential that you fill out the FAFSA form. It's often required, as we'll talk about too, for merit-based aid. So you have to have this form on file that shows all of your income, all of your assets, etc. So fill out that form, absolutely should fill out that form. We'll talk more about why later. Some colleges have a requirement to fill out what is known as the CSS profile. This is offered by the College Board, same people who bring us the SAT that we know and love. The CSS profile is a little bit more invasive and it asks a lot more questions about your income and your assets. Basically, I talk about it as being the, the it's like the police that come in your house and uh, you know check under the mattress and look in the medicine cabinet for every single last penny you have. So this is a little bit more invasive. Only about 260 colleges or so use this, but as you might expect, these are the most expensive and often the most prestigious colleges in the United States mostly private, but there are a few public schools that also require it. The, the CSS profile is just more invasive. So some schools re will require both the FAFSA and the CSS profile. Some will just require the FAFSA. Then there are some other schools that may require an additional form. So you might have as many as three forms, FAFSA, CSS profile, and then the institutional form. Or you might have just the FAFSA and the institutional form, or the FAFSA and the CSS profile. It depends on your school. Look it up. It's very clear on the financial aid portion of the website of any college exactly what forms are going to be required. But know that the least invasive the baseline is the FAFSA. So there are two basic formulas for calculating financial need. And they're similar and different in certain ways. So you have the federal formula and the institutional formula. The federal formula is based on the FAFSA. The institutional formula is based on the FAFSA, the CSS profile, and any other forms that the school may require. So the federal formula is relatively consistent across the country and financial aid directors are supposed to apply that formula in fairly consistent ways. Whereas the 
institutional formula is institution by institution. And while there are some consistencies in how the CSS profile is interpreted, different universities can, can exclude certain data if they want to come up with a different number. So the important thing to remember here is that you need to use both the federal formula and the institutional formula anytime you are offered that opportunity to calculate your financial need you want to plug in both numbers because those formulas are different and you'll come up with different numbers but the thing that's common in both of them is no matter what it is the college that will decide what your price will be they use their formulas and they come up with the price tag for you so again you have the power to decide whether you're going to pay that but the colleges have the power to decide what is it that they think based on all the information they've received and based on based on the formulas that they're supposed to use they get to decide what your price will be so what are the basic variables that are included in these formulas again i'm not going to go into a deep dive on all of these different things because i know you have questions and i know you have concerns based on your own personal circumstances but i'm going to gloss over that. I want to go through the very, very basic high-level information. So the things that are included generally in these formulas are fairly standard. It's all the money you have in the bank. That includes all your savings accounts. That includes the 529s you may have set up that are tax deferred. They're tax, they're, they're eligible for, you know, pre-tax money, but that is considered savings and will be considered fair game in the financial aid a process. All income from all sources. So if you have rental properties and you have income from that, that will be included. If you have passive income from equities, that will be included. Any income that you get on a regular basis will be included. Real estate and other assets, the value of those assets will be included in the formulas. Many annuities also might be included in the formula and here as you can see on the other side of the equation, some annuities are not included. So you need to make sure, depending on the school and depending on the kind of annuity you own, whether or not that might be included in the formula. And then any annual contributions you make to your own retirement account, those will be considered as part of your income in a given year. So all of these things, basically they just want to know how much money you have and they're going to really look at everything. What's generally not included are your retirement assets. So if you have money in 401ks, in, in IRAs, in other investment vehicles that are set up to be retirement advantaged, those will not be included. Now they will ask about them. And if you have tons and tons of money in them, then remember who gets to decide how much money you have to pay. Well, the colleges will decide. And if you've just got millions and millions of dollars in your retirement account, you're going to have a hard time hiding that from them. They may ask you to dip into it, even though you may be cash poor in the present. Again, some annuities may be excluded, and also the cash value of life insurance policies generally is not included. Although the CSS profile, because it is more invasive, will ask you about these things. So, there are certain things that you, you, you want to protect your retirement, and I, colleges and the formulas do also want to do that. So think about that as you're, you're developing your own savings strategy. Sometimes it makes sense to put things in your retirement account more than it makes sense to put it in your, your kids 529 for their education because that 529 is going to be assessed whereas the retirement accounts generally will not as long as not you <laughs> within reason. Again, the FAFSA and the CSS profile are different. The federal methodologies and the institutional methodologies that flow from these two forms are different in many, many, many detailed ways. I'm not going to get into all those details, but I'm going to point out the two most important ways in which these differ. The first is that the FAFSA excludes the equity on your home. So if you have paid off your home, don't worry, the FAFSA will not take that into account and not, will not expect you to sell your home tomorrow in order to pay for college. However, the CSS profile 
does take your home equity into account unless the institution decides not to include that. And there are institutions that decide not to even though they ask for it on the CSS profile. But generally speaking, that's the big difference between these two forms. The other big difference is that your the value of a small business, if you are a small business owner, that value of the business will not be included in the federal formula. However, it can be included in the institutional formula because the CSS profile will ask you about the value of your company. And that, as a small business owner, is always a hard thing to figure out and to value fairly you know, because if you were going to sell your company, how much would it be worth tomorrow? So those are the two main differences. Again, there are many, 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 many others, and I'm not going to get into those details, but these are two of the most important. So how do you know if you are qualified for need-based aid? You do these forms, you fill them out, you give them all the information, you know that the formulas are different, but how do you know? Well, the first thing is you have to calculate, and, and this is where you put pen to paper, you calculate the cost of attendance. What is the price generally going to be at this university that you're interested in? Then you look at your EFC, your expected family contribution. This is what is spit out by the federal formula and the FAFSA. This is the amount of money based on your assets and income that the formula says you should be able to pay for your child's education. Now, again, the government is saying this is what you should be able to pay. Is that what you want to pay? Probably not. In most cases, most families will look at their EFC and go, really, uh, you need me to pay that much money? Uh. Some families will be surprised, though, that their EFC is actually not so bad. It's pretty low and lower than they expected. But that's less common. It's more common that families that I work with and hear about and get phone calls from, they're shocked at what the EFC tells them they should be able to pay. Again, do you have to pay that? Not necessarily. Sort of depends on some other things as we'll talk about. You can learn your EFC prior to filling out all the forms if you go to some websites like the FAFSA Forecaster and begin to figure out what your EFC is. Again, you can start the FAFSA in October of your child's senior year to learn what that will be. But the FAFSA forecaster is something that you can use for planning purposes to determine at least what you anticipate that EFC will be. Net price calculators are really handy tools that were mandated by the Obama administration so that the price would become more transparent for all consumers. So. All colleges are required to have a net price calculator or an NPC on their website. Sometimes they're hard to find, but if you use the little search bar, net price calculator, it'll pop up. So you can fill in on each individual college's website information about your income and your assets, basically some of the same high level information that you put into the FAFSA. Put that information and make sure it's real. Don't be optimistic. Don't guess. Actually look at your balances of your bank accounts and whatever to know that it's real money, not just the imaginary money you hope you're saving. Look at, your, look at it real and then put that information into the calculator. Then you also will put in your child's SAT or ACT score and their GPA because some of the money might be merit money. And we'll come to that in a minute, but this is a way for you to know how much this particular college will cost you based on real information about your assets and income and about your students' abilities and talents. This is not a promise. This figure that you will get on the net price calculator is directional. It will give you an idea of what you will be expected to pay. Not exact, but it's pretty good and they're, they're not bad at giving uh, the, the prediction a pretty good guesstimate of what it is you're going to pay. So finally, this question of whether or not you qualify for need-based aid depends on the college itself. Keep in mind that not all colleges have a lot of money and they don't have big financial aid budgets. So while the EFC might tell you that supposedly you should pay this much, 
or the, the net price calculator might tell you that ordinarily you could expect to pay this much. If the college simply does not have the money to give away, they can't give a money away that they don't have, just like you can't spend money you don't have. Well, there's of course credit cards, but you know, and debt is the American way, but colleges can't operate that way. So if they don't have tons and tons of money, then you and your student may not qualify or may not be given the award because they just don't have the money. So what, do we, what does this mean? It means two things. Number one, don't assume that the cost of attendance is the cost to you for that particular college. You need to do the research and the homework to check out your EFC, to look at the net price calculators, and really understand what you can expect to pay at a particular college. But at the same time, also understand that the EFC, or the amount of money that the colleges will tell you that you should pay, may be more than you actually want to pay. Or, you can also think of it this way, that the EFC is not a promise. It is not a promise by the university. They may be able to give you a price that is higher than what your EFC states. And this pre presents some other problems that we'll talk about in a second. When we talk about financial aid, we're really talking about three different types of aid. And this goes back to the, a, an earlier slide when we were talking about the, the kinds of money available to you. The first kinds of aid that you really want to maximize is OPM, right? Other people's money. And that is the grants and the scholarships that your student can be awarded by the college. Now, these grants and scholarships come from two sources. They come either from the college themselves or they are federal or state dollars that are allocated through the college to people who qualify for those funds. Grants and scholarships do not have to be repaid. These are gifts. These are, these are bonbons. This is, the, this is the money that everybody wants, right? The, the free money that we hope flows freely. <laughs> Unfortunately, it doesn't flow as freely as all of us would wish, and this is where we can get too optimistic about this whole process, but what we're looking for is those grants and scholarships. Then, of course, we have loans, and that is really helpful, except that it is still your money, your money later, right? You can get some money now to pay for those college bills, but you or your student or both will have to pay it back later. The primary federal loan program is called the Stafford Loan Program, and this has been around for a long time. And there are two different kinds of loans that are offered under this program. There are subsidized loans and unsubsidized loans. Basically, the difference is a subsidized loan has a bit lower interest rate and you don't have to start paying back that loan until six months after graduation. Or to put it a different way, the interest does not start kicking in until after the student has graduated. An unsubsidized loan may have a slightly higher interest rate, but most importantly, the interest begins accruing from the day that you take out the loan. So you will have four to five years of interest accrual by the time the student graduates. So keep that in mind that the, the unsubsidized loan is a more expensive loan. But these are some of the most helpful loans that are available to students and we'll talk about more about those loans in a minute. There are of course loans that parents can take out from banks. These are loans that are available on the open market and these are huge pots of cash and in fact Americans have more student loan debt than we have credit card debt now which is pretty amazing. I mean we, we pay more for student loans than we pay for you know our, our big screen TVs and our, <laughs> our other consumables. So this is a huge, huge market. And I really, as you'll see, I really want to steer you away from this market as much as possible because you want more OPM and you want to rely on federal grants, as federal loans as much as possible. Finally, of course, there is the work study program and not every student is going to be eligible for work study. This is something that is also decided by the formulas, both federal and institutional, as to whether you qualify for the federal work study program. And what that is, is it's money that's set aside by the government that helps to 
pay student workers at the university. Now, a student can certainly get other kinds of employment during their undergraduate years, but this is a specific kind of employment that is subsidized by the government. So you may get a, a, an award that averages around $1,500 per semester maximum, and it's a, it's a relatively small amount of, of money. Students can get other kinds of jobs off campus. Sometimes those jobs pay better, but um, you may see work study as a part of your aid package. Finally, I just want to remind you that work study is your money or your child's money. It is not OPM. It is not aid. So we have to think of it. We have to think of it carefully that way. So a lot of people assume that students can go out and borrow as much as they want or need in order to fund their higher education, their first, their bachelor's degree. That is false. Think about it. How many banks you know would would lend money to somebody who has no job and no assets? Not very many. It's only the federal guarantee that allows for students with no income and no assets and generally no knowledge or, or skills to go sell. The federal government guarantees these loans so that students can borrow for their education, but it's only $27,000 over the course of four years. 5,500 year one, 6,500 year two, 7,500 years three and four, that's it. That is all a student can take out. Not very much. Beyond the $27,000, parents have to take out the money. Now, the money can be for the benefit of the student, but you, parent, are going to be co-signing that loan, or you may be signing it entirely, depending on the loan program. But keep this in mind, your student can only take out $27,000 per four years of education. And when we think that Harvard costs over 70 grand per year, $27,000 is not going to cover very much of it. So keep that in mind. Students can only take out $27,000 total. I want to share with you, just remind you about how loans work. And I'm sorry that this seems very remedial, but I think it's really important because, again, families are getting themselves into way too much debt in their pursuit of higher education for their kids, and it can be ruinous. Let me explain. So here's how $27,000 looks in terms of paying it back. I'm using a 5% interest rate for illustration purposes only. Right now, actually, it's a little less than that, but it does vary. So we're going to use a 5% interest rate, and if we pay it back over 10 years or over 20 years, we can see that the payment, monthly payment, for the student to pay that back is reasonable. It's doable, right? If we're doing it over 10 years, it's less than $300 a month. Now we have to remind ourselves that rent in some cities in America is a lot more than $300 a month, even if it's four kids sharing an apartment. So, and if you're thinking about, you know, whether they have to pay for a car or they have to pay for their Uber rides or something else, and they need to feed themselves, and they may want to take off a little bit of time every once in a while to do something fun, you know, go to a concert or whatever it is they want to do, still $300 a month is a significant chunk of their earnings right out of college. If they do it over 20 years, it's a little less, it's a little less than $200, but again, it's doable, they have to plan for it, and they need to understand that this is going to be required of them six months after they graduate. So, again, it's important to share this information with students because this is the amount that they alone are eligible to take out for their education, and they will, no matter what, be responsible for this amount of money. But let's look at a higher debt burden and what that really means. And here we're going to assume, assume that you're going to take out $150,000 for educating your child. And this is not uncommon, folks. This is not uncommon. I see this happening more often than I would like to admit. But these loans are at a higher interest rate. These are loans that are available pretty much on the private market. They're not subsidized. 
and they have a higher interest rate. If we look at what the payment plan would be over 10 and over 20 years, and if we think about a student exiting college with a degree in pretty much anything, we can see that the burden here is quite heavy. I want to focus primarily on that monthly payment. When you think about an $1,800 payment, if you're doing a 10-year plan, or if you're thinking about even $1,200 to $1,300 payment for a 20-year plan, that is a lot of money to have to pay before you pay rent, before you pay for a car before you pay for your Netflix subscription and your telephone bill. That is a very, very heavy burden. And so you parents may say, well, sure, I'll sign that loan. That's because it's going to be for my kid. Okay, that's great. But are you really providing an opportunity for your child or are you providing an anvil around them, their neck that, that will be very, very difficult for them to get out from under? I think this is too much. For a young person, I don't care whether they become an investment banker or anything else. I want to also posit this, that if they have this debt, it drastically reduces their choices upon graduation because they must, they must get the highest paying job that they possibly can in order to repay this loan. This is a loan that is not discharged even in bankruptcy. Parent loans are not going to be discharged upon the death of your child or the disability of your child because you parents will be on the hook for this money. So those are very morbid and terrible things to be thinking about, but this is really, really important. Too many families are taking out too much debt based on the idea that their child is above average. Just like Garrison Keillor and Lake Wobegon saying, you know, all of our kids are above average. Well, we all want to believe that in our kids and our kids will make above average salaries. But some of them don't. And some of them want to become special ed teachers after going to NYU and having $200,000 in debt. And I know a family in which this is actually the case. $200,000 in debt. And the young woman who's a charming young woman and a very talented educator, she wants to be a special ed teacher, making barely $30,000 per year. A person making $30,000 a year could live on their own in a decent place and have a little bit of money left over if they were very frugal. But a special education teacher cannot pay $1,300 in student loans and then pay rent and then pay for their Netflix subscription and their telephone and oh, maybe they want to go out to dinner and have, you know, General Gao's chicken at, at the Chinese restaurant. They're not going to be able to afford that. So while education is an opportunity, it is not priceless. It can be a burden that is too much for a young person to bear. Now, if you, if you have the wherewithal to pay back these loans without any problem and you can pay back the, the $1,800 or the $1,300 per month, and you are going to take that out yourself for your child's education, that's great. But if the idea is you're going to give this burden to your child, I want you to think twice. I want you to think twice as to whether that's really smart for your child's future. Is it an opportunity or is it an unbearable burden that will hamper their future more than it helps? Fortunately, however, there is a thing called merit aid. And this is for students who have great talents and great test scores and great grades, and they can earn money from colleges to reduce the cost of their education overall. Schools use merit aid for a whole variety of reasons, partly to shape their class partly to ensure that they have smart students because, you know, faculty members, I used to be a professor, faculty members really like teaching smart students and really engaged students. That, those are the students that every professor wants in their classroom. They don't want the deadbeats at the back of the room that never hand in their homework, right? They want the students who, who care about what they're learning. So the admissions office uses the money that they have available to them to create the class that they want and need. If it's a Division I school, they're going to use athletic scholarships to make sure that they get the 
athletic teams rounded out. But even when we're talking about the marching band or we're talking about the variety of majors that exist on campus, the admissions office is going to use this money not only to help you as family, but as I've said many times, they're going to pursue their own institutional interests by giving money to the students that they need to create the kind of campus, the kind of community that they want and need to create. Always and everywhere, the most sought after students are the students with the highest test scores and the best grades. A talented student is the one that gets the most money. The cold hard fact is that good students get, not only do they get merit aid, do they get more in the way of merit aid, but they also get more in need-based aid. Because again, the need-based aid budget of any college is not infinite. They must allocate it to the students that they really want and they really need. And the ones who are gonna get the most money for both need and merit are the students with the best grades and the best test scores. So this is how your student can make the most money over the course of their high school career is by having good grades and good test scores. I can't tell you how many times that I told my own kids that an A is money in the bank. An A is opportunity for you in the future. Yes, I'll be happy too. Dad will be happy. Yay, he gets bragging rights. But no, it gives opportunity to the student. They have more possibility because they can command more money in the process. Similarly, every point on the ACT, every 100 points on the SAT helps to give more money, more resources, reducing the cost of college education. I don't care whether you're a need-based student or a merit-based student, or you get both. The higher your test scores, the higher your grades, the more money you get in this process. So I can't tell you how many times I get families who call me and say, well, I have a student who's a B minus student and has dead average SATs. And I'm just shocked, shocked that we didn't get financial aid. We didn't get enough in the way of financial aid to, to attend the student's dream college. Yeah, that's sad, but it's not, it's, it's logical. It's totally understandable because resources are finite. Students who are good are the ones who are going to be in demand because those students are the best students and the money is not going to be left over for the average student or the below average student. So this is something that you can talk to your students about from the very beginning, from the very beginning of high school and say, you want to go to college? Great. Good grades and good test scores are what's going to make it possible for you to attend. Whether you have need, whether you, have, whether you want merit, either way, good students get more money. I want to illustrate this, and it's a little bit hard to read, and, and the details here, I'll, I, you can you know, freeze the frame and do a little um, expanding and you know, blow it up for yourself. But this is from Miami University of Ohio. And this shows you, this is from their website, and it shows you very clearly how they award merit-based aid. The higher the test score, the higher the GPA, the more money they get. And it's very clear, and it's by numbers, right? It's, it's by thresholds. So in some cases, 20 points on the SAT would get you more money. An extra point on the ACT would get you maybe $2,000 a year. $2,000 a year times four is $8,000 for one point on the ACT. How can a student make $8,000 quickly? Raise their ACT by one point. So this is, this is the kind of thing that you should share with your kids early on so they really understand that good students not only get into college, but they can pay for it. So what do you do if you don't qualify for need-based aid, if your only option is merit-based aid? Well, at many, many schools out there, merit-based aid will be available. Now, there are some places where it won't be. First, it won't be at the really high-end, very selective colleges and universities, especially the private ones. 
Harvard, Princeton, Yale, the Ivy, Stanford, Chicago, etc. There, there is no such thing as merit-based aid at those schools. Now, there also will be limited merit-based aid, if any, at a lot of public universities because they simply don't have the money, right? We, we as voters have decided that higher education is not something that the whole community should pay for. It's actually something that individual families should pay for. Whether we agree with that or not, that's what voters have, have generally decided in this country. So the co colleges don't have a lot of money to give in terms of merit-based aid. So again, don't assume that just because the FAFSA forecaster or the net price calculator or whatever says this is the price that you're going to pay, it's not necessarily the case. Now there are a couple of strategic issues that I'm just going to lay out here as questions and I will dig into these in greater detail in other places, but first of all we have to think about the application itself. If you don't qualify for need-based aid, should you check on the application that you will be or will not be pursuing need-based aid. If you know absolutely that you do not qualify for need-based aid, say you won't be pursuing it. That doesn't mean that you can't submit the FAFSA or the CSS profile or the forms, because in many cases, like I said, merit-based aid may be predicated on having those forms. But if you know that you don't qualify for need-based aid, then, and you know you've done your homework, you've looked at the NPCs, you look at the EFCs, your EFC is crazy high, no, there's no way that you're gonna get any, any need-based aid, then say no, I'm not looking for need-based aid. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't fill out the FAFSA. You should probably still fill it out, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The other question is whether you should put the student's social security number on the application. A lot of different debates about that. I'm going to say that if you know you're not applying for need-based aid, then no need to put the social security number on there. You can. It may be make it helpful for the university later on when they're hooking up your FAFSA and your CSS profile because you're going to fill it out anyway because you're hoping that you get some merit-based aid or you might want to access to the federal loans. It makes it easier for them to link the application with the financial aid forms. Having that social security number makes that link easier. But if you know that you're not applying for need-based aid and if you're worried about having your social security number out there, you can leave that blank. But if you are applying for need-based aid, it is much more efficient to put your social security on there so that they don't get things lost in the process. You want to make sure that they're linking it up based on that number. And finally, again, people ask me, should I fill out the financial aid forms? The answer generally for absolutely everyone is yes, you should go ahead and fill them out. They're kind of a pain in the neck, but they're not so difficult. And if you are thinking that you would like to see your student get merit-based aid, or if you would like to have access to the federal loans, that 27000 even if you are relatively wealthy, your student might have access to some of those loans. And that can be nice if you want your student to have skin in the game. And to begin that, a whole process of learning about debt early on. So generally speaking, I advocate filling out the forms. I advocate putting on the Social Security number. And I, I advocate you know, being clear in the process. But honestly speaking, if you know you do not qualify for need-based aid, then do not check that box that you will be seeking it. Why? Because if the admissions officer knows that you are a full pay family, that you have the means to pay full price at that college, it's a little bit different calculation for the than for the student who has a high amount of need. Admissions officers like to be pure, they like to be optimistic, but they also know that their budgets are limited. And when they see a student who is really average, who has high need, high financial need, they're less likely to pay attention. If it's a family, a student who has no need whatsoever and can pay full price for that college, it may help you in the admissions process. So there's a lot more to talk about this and I'm, I will get into it in other places, but I just want to highlight these things. First of all, even if you don't qualify for 
need-based aid, remember that there are pots of money in the merit-based aid category at many schools. Again, what are the reasons to fill out the financial aid forms even if you know you don't qualify for need-based aid? Well, first of all, many colleges will want a benchmark, especially as students go into college for the first time. So it helps. It's like an insurance policy. Let's say the family has some sort of a crisis, a parent loses a job, or uh, income is somehow drastically reduced based on, on disability or even death. If the forms are submitted, it makes it easier and more efficient for the college to assess the change in your need because it's hooked up to all of your financial documents. So s remind yourself that circumstances can change. You may not need it now, but if you think you might need it at any point in the future, you need to have that form on file with your college. And some colleges will also require that FAFSA or the CSS profile or both if you may want to try to get aid in years two, three, and four. Maybe the student is really rocking it. Maybe they might qualify for more merit-based aid, what have you. It, you. It's very difficult to ask if you don't have the forms on file. So having the forms on file just provides that opportunity and a sense of insurance because the college has the information about you. The second thing is that many colleges will require those forms for merit-based aid. So if you don't have them on file, you will not be considered for them. So go ahead, fill it out, have it on file. That way, if your student qualifies for money, other people's money, you can actually get some. And finally, if you want access to the federal student loan program, whether subsidized or unsubsidized, Many students who don't qualify for need-based aid still can have access to that $27,000 if they fill out the FAFSA. If you don't fill out the FAFSA, you cannot have access to those loans. So if you want that, or even if you think you might want it in years two, three, and four, again, fill out the FAFSA as the student is preparing for admission. It makes it much easier later on. So that's a little bit of an overview, but how do you think about this? What are the traps for parents and, and where do we get hung up as parents all the time? And I'll tell you, this is one of the most emotional aspects of the entire college admissions and application process is the, the anguish with which we as parents approach this issue because we know, most of us, that we have not saved enough. So how do we think about it? Well, first of all, we tend unfortunately, to be internally optimistic. We inflate our assets. We inflate our income when we fill out some of these forms and these forecasters. And so we don't really wrestle with the realities. We want to be optimistic that, yeah, I'm going to get a raise next year, or my business is going to double in size next year. Well, we all want to be optimistic, but I don't think that's the best way to make a budget and to make a plan about how to pay for your child's higher education. Be realistic. The other issue is this, this, this focus on our, our responsibility and our guilt, because if we haven't been able to save enough, maybe we were just making silly choices, or maybe we just haven't had the financial success that we might have hoped for 20 years ago when our kids were just a twinkle in our eye, right? We, we haven't been able to save that money, so we feel really guilty. And we see that we're just, well, we're big fat losers, right? We, 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 we have this, this responsibility to, to do anything and everything we can to make the lives of our kids awesome. And when we realize that we just don't have the money to pay for certain things, we just feel horrible. And then that leads us to make dumb mistakes. We saddle our kids with too much debt. We look at colleges that are outside our budget. We, we, we make bad spending decisions. And it is so common in America today to make these bad spending decisions. And I understand it. I'm a parent too. And you know, I want my kid to have anything and everything. But I also want to retire. And I also want to maximize other people's money to pay for my, my own children's education. So you know, we have to find that balance. We have to find that peace within ourselves that, yes, we have responsibility, but that doesn't mean we should make dumb decisions about our own financial future or about the financial future of our children 
based on this this inflated sense of responsibility and the the guilt that goes along with that when we're not able to provide the resources that we might have hoped when they were born. So we have to get over it. We just have to get over it. We also have to get over this idea that education is always, always, always an opportunity at whatever price. It is not always an opportunity. And that's why I went through that loan thing a little bit uh, in great detail because a loan of $200,000 for an undergraduate education is not an opportunity. It is a burden. It, re it restricts the choices that a student can make, a person can make in their lives. So you don't want to do that. You want to be really careful about thinking that all education is an opportunity. And so I'll just sell the farm. I actually had a family who did that. They had a farm and they sold their main asset that had been in the family for generations and they sold it so their kid could go to a college they couldn't otherwise afford. They sold the farm. I was amazed. I was depressed. I was thinking about that child, you know, 20, 20 years later when they wake up and realize that their parents sold the farm so that they could go to college. And now the parents, what, can't retire. Oof, that's really tough. Finally, I beseech you to be clear in your communication with your student. Most families, or at least many of them, resist the idea of speaking frankly with their kids about finances. And we may help them, we, we may show them how to budget themselves and we may talk to them about how to get a job and here's the things you would need to pay for to, to learn about your own financial future, but we often don't divulge what resources are available to our kids for college. I can give you one example of a family who handled this communication very, very well. So the family came to me and said, look, I want my daughter who's very talented to be able to have every, everything and anything she wants but I have saved exactly $125,000 for her to go to college, and I probably, over the next, 20, the next four years, I can come up with $25,000 more. So we have a budget of $150,000 for her college education, period. That's it. Go shopping, was what he said to me. And that's also exactly what he told his daughter. And it was such a great experience to work with her and work with his family because the daughter got into the game and she at first started looking at colleges and some of these colleges were just not going to come in at $150,000 because the family didn't qualify for need-based aid, but this is what the family had. And so she looked at some schools and they were $300,000 or close to it anyway, if you add all the travel and add the expenses, $300,000. She's like, oh no, I can't go there, forget it. And I taught her how to guess, how to see whether or not she would come in under budget. She filled out the net price calculators. She filled out the FAFSA forecaster. She was given all the tools she needed in order to calculate what this college was going to cost for her. And so she did it. She would look at it. Did it come in under budget? No. I can't even think about this college. And she just put it out of her mind. No moaning, no groaning, no coming to daddy. Daddy, you can't pay enough for college. You're making, you, you should feel guilty and twisting that. No, she was totally awesome. And she said, well, that's the money I have. And that's still a lot of money, $150,000. That's a lot of money. So I'm really lucky. And she ended up getting into a college that at first she was like, I'm not going, I don't, I don't like that one. I really don't like that college. And then she kept looking at it because she could tell it was going to come in under budget and it was going to come in way under budget. And she kept looking at it and the more she looked at it, the more she liked it. And she kept going, she visited again and again and she started talking to people and she said, wow, you mean for that much money, I can get all this? Okay, so that's different. And you know, it's going to come in under budget. It's going to come in about half. So 75 grand for four years of education. I'm saving my dad $75,000. That's pretty cool. She ended up going to that college. 
it was really awesome. And, you know, she had absolutely no regrets. So what do you need to keep in mind as you approach the financial aid process and, and this whole uh, picking colleges? Well, first of all, don't go shopping for colleges until you have your budget. You don't go shopping for cars until you know how much you can spend on that car. You don't go shopping for a new home without knowing more or less what your budget can afford. Don't do that with colleges either. Know your budget, then go shopping. Remind yourself that you do not control the cost of college. The colleges control the price tag that they will offer you. You don't control the sticker price and you don't control, unfortunately, the offer price. So you just need to get that in your head that while it may seem that you only have this much money to pay, and you may say that this is, this is all I'm willing to pay. The college can say, well, if you want to come here, this is the price that you have to pay. And you're looking at it going, really? I have to pay that? But do you have to pay it? No. You still have the power over your own wallet, right? The third thing is that colleges expect students to be responsible for their own college costs. Once they end up going to college, they are adults, and the bills go to the student, not to the parent. The parent may be paying the bill, but believe me, you're not even going to get the bill. The student gets the bill and has to know that they have to pass it along to you if that's the arrangement, or else they have to pay it. You need to be clear about that. Colleges also expect that students will have skin in the game, that they are paying for the college in some way. Now, they know when it's a $70,000 bill, that that the student is not paying that per year, that they don't have the income and assets on, by and large. But they're treating them as adults. And then finally, remind yourself that education is not priceless. This is not a Visa commercial, right? This, you, you, you can put it on your Visa card, you can delay the costs, but they're still costs to you. Right? Student loans, parent loans, are still costs to you. Those are called financial aid in this process. Both loans and work money, savings, that is considered, that, that, that the students may make on campus, the work study program, that is considered financial aid. But I want to suggest to you that that is not financial aid. Only OPM, other people's money, is really financial aid. That's what you want to maximize. So be careful when you're thinking about this idea that education is priceless. It has a price and it has consequences. What are the resources to help you with this? I'll talk about more about these in other videos, but from the government, you definitely want to be looking at the student loan website and getting, a, a getting an idea of the information about student loans, both the federal loans and then how the government regulates the parent loans. The other two sources of information that I think are great if you're really trying, trying to take a deep dive into the financial aid process, probably the best in the world, the one that's won the most awards, is finaid.org. This is Mark Kantrowitz's website. It is awesome. It's not pretty. It's not really nicely navigable, but all the information you would ever want to learn about financial aid and more is there. So if you've got questions about particular things, I highly recommend that you look at that very, very, very long list of, of articles that the people at finaid.org have put together, and this is really solid information. The other website that I like a lot that has some good general articles is, is College Data, and I, so I recommend that to you as well. They have some good, good articles in there. I recommend that you stay away from articles and websites that are hawking student loans, especially the private student loans. They're trying to sell you something. So they're not going to be as um, hard hitting as maybe I am in telling you, please try to avoid loans as much as you possibly can because they are not opportunity, they are burdens. It's still your money, it's still your child's money. So. Don't go to those websites. Don't focus on those. When you know you will be taking out a loan, then there's research you can do on those loans. But don't use those websites. Their point of view is just skewed towards the idea that 
hey, it's priceless. Take out lots of loans and use your Visa card and, you know, everything will be hunky-dory. That's actually not the case. So I hope this has been a helpful overview of the entire process. There's so much more to talk about with financial aid. You can check out the other videos. You can check out the other resources and some of the external sites like finaid.org. Highly recommended. So we'll look forward to answering your questions as we go along. But here we go. Financial aid. Plenty to learn. Good luck. See you next time.